Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, X-linked genes and sex chromosomes, so it's going to be a little complicated and fun. Uh, we are not going to test on box 7.2 and 7.5. I might discuss some of the um, terminology and stuff there, but it's not going to be included in any testing. Okay. Trying to trim this down so we can do other stuff than during our course here. All right, so uh, overview is that we've got uh, mainly your gen bio textbook focused on mammalian species, uh, sex determinations, the X chromosome, the Y chromosome, and primarily focused on that. Um, so, but there are a lot of other different systems, especially in terms of birds and reptiles and um, uh, other animals that don't even have sex chromosomes where it's a uh, environmental um, exposure instead that determines sex. Okay. So we're going to talk a lot about those different systems. Um, we've got our genes that occur only on the X chromosome called X-linked genes. Same for Y, there are genes on the Y chromosome that don't um, occur on the X chromosome and that can be Y-determined inheritance. And uh, we're going to go over some of the most uh, basic stuff first and we'll get a little more into the intricate details. So here are two karyotypes showing the different chromosomes, okay? And in some cases, uh, people have two of the X chromosomes here, and otherwise you can have a one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. Generally, uh, that results in the, the female phenotype here and the male phenotype here, but it gets a lot more complicated than that because we've got um, regions that actually do cross over in the X and Y chromosomes and we have particular genes that cause things like testes development that can be swapped around, which we'll see in time. Okay. So we're going to pause real quick for this communicating genetics box here uh, where we're talking about how different gene names are determined. Okay. Generally, gene names are italicized. Okay. And then if we look at different organisms, uh, humans, flies, mice, all of them have different nomenclature systems because as people were working on these, they were generally uh, worked separately. There's no internet, there's no easy communication. So the primary, say, fruit fly genetics lab came up with its own way of classifying fruit fly genes. And meanwhile, the mouse labs were doing their own thing and maybe only communicating with the mouse people and they have their own set of um, uh, gene names. So that's sort of how the nomenclature systems came to be. Uh, now that we've got the internet, people working on especially like um, prokaryotes and stuff have a more uh, centralized system for naming genes and things, but we still use a lot of those sort of antiquated names just because um, they're the uh, historical equivalent there. Okay, now the three main things when genes are getting named, uh, originally mutant phenotype was what the genes were named. So if you had a, say when a gene got broken and then the fly just dis, uh, displayed like a white eye as opposed to a regular eye, that gene was called white in terms of not the wild type phenotype, but of the mutant phenotype. So that happens a lot, especially in sort of the older systems where you tracked mutations based on uh, what phenotype got, um, what the mutant phenotype looked like. Um, and then for a lot of the metabolomic stuff, like if something is coding for an enzyme, then you name the gene after the enzyme it makes. You're, you're naming the gene after the gene product. Uh, and then the third most common type of naming is homology, where you find a gene in, say, uh, chimpanzees that you saw in gorillas. And so in the chimp, you name this gene something like gorilla amylase 2 because it has that homology with a previously known gene. So you do see some genes that are named after genes that they are uh, related to in different species. Okay? So that's sort of the idea of that communicating genetics box there. All right, so next section is about how the X chromosome is inherited and then about X-linked genes. So here's sort of the classic um, X-linked trait example here, the white eyes and drosophilia. I think it's actually the same in your um, gen bio textbook. So we have our wild type female here. And since they have two copies of the X chromosome, they have two copies of the, the wild type allele here. And then on the male, this male is actually hemizygous for this trait. Hemizygous meaning, you know, half a cop half the copies for hemi, and only has a copy of the white allele on the X chromosome because the Y chromosome does not contain it. Okay, so here we go. We've got our white-eyed fly made male mated to a wild-type female, and so all of the offspring are going to have red eyes. This trait is recessive, 
And if we look specifically at the male, because it received the Y chromosome from its father, it had to receive an X chromosome from its mom, and all of those X chromosomes were the wild type allele. Okay? Meanwhile, in the females, they are carrying one of each. They got one X chromosome from mom and an X chromosome from dad. Okay? And so down here in this, uh, we're seeing the Punnett square, and we're seeing that we're actually tracking both the chromosome and the allele in this case. We want to know which, um, because in the case of the Y, the Y is not carrying a, a allele. Okay? So this is the terminal, sort of, um, uh, terminology for how we're going to do a cross if we're looking at a X or a Y linked gene. So next, we take our uh, F1s here. We're going to mate them to each other and get the F2 generation there. And now we're going to see that trait emerge in the F2 generation, but only in the males, only when we have one copy of the X chromosome. Because uh, in the males, they had to have gotten that Y chromosome from their dad, and that leaves it open for them to possible to half and half chance. Half of the uh, male offspring are going to get the X chromosome with the wild type allele, and half are going to get the chromosome with the mutant allele. Okay? So we're going to see different inheritance here and different um, sort of phenotypes and, and genotypes than we do in strict Mendelian inheritance, but they do follow the same rule because we're looking at segregated chromosomes, that the X and Y are segregating independently. Okay. <clears throat> so there they go. We're only going to see those alleles on the X chromosome, and we do want to follow where the Y chromosome is going, so that's going to get placed in our Punnett square or our forked line diagram as well. Okay, so it is possible to have um, white-eyed females, okay, and that'll happen if we have a carrier here or a female that has the allele for the white uh, mutation and a um, father that also is carrying an X chromosome with the white allele there. Because then, uh, half and half again, we're going to see, um, so here's, here are the females. These are the ones that got an X chromosome from dad. Okay? And some of them are going to get the wild type from their mom, but some are going to get a white allele from both parents, and then those are actually going to have the phenotype. The, the recessive phenotype is going to come out there. Again over here, so same as last time. Uh, for the males, they both got Y chromosome from their dad, so it really depends which X chromosome they got from mom, whether they got the mutant or the wild type. Okay. So if we have that, also if you if the if we take the female with white eyes and, and breed it with a white-eyed male, we would then get all white-eyed um, offspring there. Okay. So female flies can have white eyes, but they have to be homozygous for the uh, white allele there. And so you also see this sort of crisscross inheritance where it switches um, between generations. If you have a white-eyed female and you take a, a regular male, the phenotype ends up crossing, in a sense, to the other uh, sex there. Because in order to be a male, this fly is only getting a Y chromosome from dad. And so it will have to get whatever um, chromosome we got X chromosome from mom. And in this case, both of them are going to actually code for the white mutation. So in the, this generation, we've got the mutation in the females. And then the next generation, it appears to pop out in the males. And that's due to the fact that the male must get his X chromosome from his mom. And then all the, yeah, again, the, since the male here is giving the uh, dominant gene, the daughter offspring will get a copy of that, and that will override the white mutation. Okay. And there's the male. So what we would refer to as this is that the males, uh, they're also called a heterogametic sex. Okay, so because heter as opposed to homogametic, which is the female. Female has the same chromosome, right? So homo for same, uh, two X chromosomes. Heterogametic sex means you have two different chromosomes there. Okay, so there's our crisscross inheritance. This will lead us further into pedigrees about um, in this idea of the the carrier um, can be a female. Females can carry a trait. They can have that one copy of the recessive trait, but it's in them dominated by the uh, wild type trait. But then that could um, express in their sons, the sons that are only inheriting one chromosome and it's from their mom. Okay? So X-like traits are going to appear and manifest much more frequently in males. And um, mothers, that if, if you have an affected son, if that ever pops up, then the mother must have been a carrier, right? There must have been a, um, 
a um, X chromosome with a mutation on it in the, present in the mother. Okay? But they could not have the, the not express the phenotype themselves if it's a recessive phenotype where you require um, either two copies on uh, if you have two X chromosomes or just the one copy if you only have one X chromosome. Okay. Y linked traits are also possible. You can get a mutation on a Y chromosome. That's even easier to track. That is literally only shows up in males because the females are not receiving uh, a Y chromosome, then they are not getting the trait at all. And you just see this uh, multi-generational passing of the trait down through um, the different lines from father to son, from son to grandson and so on and so forth. So uh, one of these being the gene for hairy ears, it's a hypertrichosis pineoris. Um, ladies, you generally don't have to deal with this unless there's some sort of interesting crossover event going on between the X and Y chromosome. That is a Y carry trait and also the sex determining region gene. So this leads us to the X chromosome, how exactly it segregates during meiosis and errors in this are a little more frequent than they are in the autosomes, in the non-sex chromosomes, because the um, non-sex chromosomes are pretty much the same size. You don't have to deal with um, having one chromosome that is far bigger from the other and yet still parent trying to pair up and split off during meiosis appropriately. So this leads us to X chromosome non-disjunction, okay, uh, which can happen in, again, both in meiosis one and meiosis two. So in meiosis one, uh, we would have our, our gamete or our pre-gamete here, and it would go through meiosis one, and the two homologous X chromosomes would not pull apart, okay? They should pull apart and then split into their sister chromatids later, but in this case, they are pulled into with this precursor cell here. And then when it's uh, the sister chromatids uh, pull apart, the um, ova here end up getting two, uh, one from each of the sister chromatid copies rather than just one, okay? And then you end up having some gametes that do not have any um, sex chromosomes at all over here. So the fly will produce these ovums that have two X chromosomes, both that have the alleles, or you get ovums with no sex chromosomes at all. The meiosis 2 tries, proceeds normally, but you end up do, having this double X chromosome in, in the cells regardless. Okay. And so when you mate that fly with um, a regular fly, a wild type male in this case, you're going to have some interesting um, results here. Number one, you're going to have a female that pops up that has three X chromosomes. Okay. You're going to have a female that pops up with two X chromosomes and one Y chromosome. We're going to have a male pop up that has one X chromosome, but is sterile and cannot reproduce. And then you're actually just going to have a um, one, one to one to one ratio because this guy here that just has a Y chromosome is going to die. Okay, so the presence of a Y chromosome isn't actually turning things male or female. Hmm. Okay. So, We've got our, um, this triple X female fly. Okay. We've got a XX ovum produced with a Y that gets us a um, XXY fly that is phenotypically female. We get an ovum with no X that is fertilized with a sperm with a max and that gives us a male fly that ends up being sterile. So a one X means male. And then if we have no X at all and Y it dies because it just, it needs all the other genes on the X chromosome to live. So that's a little interesting. It turns out that sex determination in flies okay, depends on the number of X chromosomes, the fact it being one. One X chromosome means you're male. More than that means you're female. The Y chromosome doesn't actually determine sex in flies. So this is where it's interesting when we use something as a model organism, but it turns out that they do something uh, kind of significantly differently than we do. So there are limits to how useful different organisms can be. Right. So this is how the um, people were able to stain lots of fly eggs and see the chromosome number and everything. And they were able to watch this non disjunction and whether how many X chromosomes you ended up with determining your sex, uh, revealing these mechanisms of sex determination. So again, in meiosis one, um, let's look at both a, a meiosis one in both males and females. During meiosis one, you get a gamete that has both homologs here and one that has neither. Right? So in males it means one gamete is getting both X's and Y's and the other doesn't have any chromosomes at all. And then in females the gamete will have um, 
two, two X chromosomes, which may have differing alleles there. Okay, so this non-disjunction of meiosis one gets us gametes that are either heterogametic, okay, or heterozygous, okay, and this can occur for any chromosome here. Okay. So now at meiosis two, um, this is where the first division proceeds as normal. First division proceeds as normal. Uh, not shown over here are the gametes that come out fine and don't have an issue, or same over here. But then in one of the two um, precursor cells here, we have a non-disjunction. And then we can see, um, we can either have two X's here, but in this case, this Y, where it's, um, these are actually the sister chromatids here that don't break up, we'll go together, we'll end up getting a double Y chromosome. Double Y chromosome, this, this can only end up because of a non-disjunction at meiosis two. Okay. So this is where we get sperm cells that might have two copies of the Y chromosome. And then an X is similar, you can also have the, the double X's. Okay. So these disomic gametes okay, can determine which meiotic division was affected. If you see this YY uh, symptom, it means that this uh, the meiosis one did go properly. We did separate the X and Y, but then meiosis two failed. As opposed to before, um, we were seeing everything being digametic. Um, 